When the birds of America first began to appear in 1827, it was a revelation. No one had seen anything like this before. A book this size, a book with such vivid depictions of birds in their natural context. After that, no natural history artist could ever go back to the old model of working in museums with taxidermied specimens. Artists had to go out into the field. John James Audubon is known through the eponymous Audubon Society. He was a great conservationist as well as a fantastic artist and ornithologist. He was born illegitimately in Haiti in 1785. He lived in France till about 17 when he came to the United States. Audubon wasn't the first great ornithological artist, but when you look at those earlier works, from the 16th, 17th, 18th century, the birds look dead. And that's because the artists were working from stuffed specimens in cabinets and museums, sometimes put into unnatural poses and devoid of any environment or context. What Audubon did was to depict the birds as they were in their habitats. He studied the birds carefully he actually devised his own method of wiring the birds into a pose that he had observed in the field. He also developed a grid pattern for his paper, like graph paper, so he could keep the proportions right. He showed the shrubbery or ground or trees where they lived. He showed the things that they fed on. In 1820, he decided to dedicate his life to trying to paint every single species of bird in the United States. Audubon really wanted to turn this private passion into a commercial work, and he made the extraordinary decision that he was going to publish every bird at its natural size. For cardinals, pigeons, Baltimore Orioles, no issue. But when you're talking about whooping cranes and flamingos and eagles, that needed a particular manufacturer of paper. He went to England and hired the James Watman Company to produce these gigantic sheets of paper, almost 40 by 30 inches. The size of Audubon's book was absolutely unprecedented. You have this monumental work of four volumes that stand almost four feet high with 435 sheets of paper, engraved aquatints depicting every bird that he could find. This was not a book that he was going to complete and send to bookstores. This was a work that he worked on for a couple of decades. And so like many books at that period, it was sold by subscription and published over a period of years. The Birds of America is known worldwide as a great book, but it's more than that. It's a great work of art. It's a great work of writing, of literature. And although there's nothing anthropomorphized about Audubon's birds, he does show them as individuals. The whooping crane is delicately picking up a tiny little alligator who doesn't know what fate is about to befall him. And I always feel when you look at that pair of passenger pigeons, you're looking at two birds that really knew each other, the flamingo. It was just so audacious to think that you could fit a bird like that at life size into a book. Audubon does cheat a little bit by having the neck go all the way down and then the head come back up in a U. And this startling scarlet red of the flamingo that, I think, is Audubon's achievement in a single play. Between 175 and 200 sets were produced. Our best guess now is that there are 119 complete or largely complete sets extant. Of the 119 sets that survive, the vast majority are in permanent institutional homes. There are 15 that are privately owned including the one that we're offering in December. This copy was subscribed for by the Yorkshire Philosophical Society. It survived in wonderful condition because the book was maintained 
not overhandled. Almost two centuries later, the book is still revered as an icon. It's just as marvelous as the birds that it depicts. Mm -hmm.